This morning, the title of the message is The Rule of Evil. So if you have your Bibles open, let's read Revelation 13, 7. And it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you, Lord, that you give us insight and understanding to the future and the present. And we thank you, Lord, that we don't have to wonder what's going to happen, but we know what's going to happen. And so we thank you for your word today, and we pray that you would continue to teach us your ways by your spirit now through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, here in verse 7, uh, it speaks about the Antichrist and that he's going to be granted authority over all the nations, and it is going to be a rule of evil. Now, in verse 2, it tells us, now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. So the Antichrist's power comes from the dragon. And as we have been studying through the book of Revelation, this one world leader's coming on the scene, and he's going to be empowered by the dragon. Now, who is the dragon, and, and how do we know who the dragon is? Well, as we've talked about before, uh, the Bible is the best commentary on the Bible, and we read uh, Revelation 12, 9, it says, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil. So we know uh, that the dragon is the devil. Now, uh, we talked about previously where Adam and Eve sinned and they forfeited the deed, title deed to the earth to Satan. And so currently, the Bible tells us that Satan is the prince of the power of the air. In 1 John 5, 19, it says, the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. So that's important to understand when you think about what's going on in the world and why is God letting what happened happen and uh, to realize that the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. So we know that Satan uh, claimed to have power over the earth. Remember when uh, he tempted Jesus and uh, Satan offered the kingdoms of this world to Jesus and said, they're all mine and I can give them to whoever I wish. There in Matthew 4, 8, where it says, again, the devil took him up an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, all these things I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. Now, Jesus did not dispute that claim that he said, hey, all these are mine and I can give them to whoever I wish. So we know that even the Apostle Paul calls Satan the God of this world in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, where he says, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them who believeth not. And so uh, when, we, when we look at the world and what's going on in the world, we realize that today Satan is ruling over the world, but he's kind of doing it in a covert way, right? Uh, and, and we know that he has the ability to deceive people and to make people think that what he's doing is good. Uh, in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, 14, the Bible says, Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. So Satan can make people think that he's an angel, right? And Satan controls the governments of this world from behind the scenes. And he deceives people into thinking that what's going on is good. Now, what's really amazing for many Christians is that you look at what's happening in the world and Many Christians say, how can this be? What's going on? Why is this happening? And at the same time, there is a large segment of unbelievers who say, things are going great. You wonder, well, how can that be? How do you, you know, reconcile those things in your mind? Well, when you understand that the Bible says that uh, you know, the power brokers of this world and the government, many of the government leaders of this world uh, are influenced by a, another force, right? As the Apostle Paul tells us who the power brokers are in the world in Ephesians 6, 12. He says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So he's talking about people who are in power, the money brokers, the powerful government leaders, right? That there is a spiritual battle going on. When you look at that, it, it seems very confusing. Like, why do they say one thing and do another? Well, because there is a spiritual battle force at work, right? And there is a spiritual battle going on. And they do exactly opposite of what they say. Why? Well, because that's what they do. That's what the kingdom of darkness does. It's deceitful, right? And uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. In other words, it's saying that for people who are spiritually dead, they don't really even understand what they're doing, right? I mean, for some people, they really believe that, that the things that they're doing are good for people. If you are spiritually alive and you understand that God loves people and God doesn't want people to ruin their lives, then you realize that is not good for people. We see this world leader, when he comes on the scene in verse four, it says, so they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast and they worship the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And 
He was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. So when this Antichrist comes on the scene, he's ruling over the world as the one world ruler, and it is going to be a rule of evil like no other time in the history of the world because the church is going to be removed. And when the church is gone, man, it, it just imagine what it's going to be like. And we know that right now the Bible says that the, there is something that restrains. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, it says, For the mystery of the lawless is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way, and then the lawless one will be revealed. Now, when it's talking about uh, he who restrains, who is that? It's the church, right? Who, who stands up and says, you know what? I think it's wrong to make heroin legal. The reality is, is that the church is restraining now. And here in Revelation 13, there's going to be nothing to hinder the world from giving itself entirely to the wickedness uh, that it wants. Now, right now, the church speaks up against evil and restrains it. And, and, and I think it's important for us to understand that because sometimes when we go through the book of Revelation, we wonder, what should we do? Well, Jesus said that we should have occupy until he comes, right? We shouldn't uh, just hide out and think, okay, the rapture's coming. And no, we're to be about our Father's business until he comes. We're to be being a light in this world, right? To be sharing the gospel and doing what we can to share the truth with people and in a loving way, right? And, and I, I try to be loving when I share about the stupid things that I don't know what the right words are to say about people who, who just, you know, are doing things that are just so destructive to people in society. But the Bible says that we as the church, we're here to be a light. And Revelation 3, 7, he said, you have a little strength. To the church at Philadelphia, right? I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, and have kept my word, and have not denied my name. So he said to the church there in Philadelphia, uh, and, and I think that that could be applied to the church today, the last day's church, that the church had a little strength to stand against the tide of evil that's trying to take over the world. And, and, and that is what we're to do. We're to be light. We're to be salt. So we have a little strength. We don't have to be super strong to stand up in the power of Jesus. And when the church, even though it only has a little strength, is removed, then the world's going to plunge into evil, darkness, and destruction that's hard to comprehend. But until then, right, we're to be light in this world. So when you wonder, as we go through the book of Revelation, what should I be doing? You should be shining for Jesus, right? What does that mean? You should be sharing God's love with people. And you should be sharing God's truth with people. Now, everywhere, not just, uh, and I think sometimes, that in church we can get the idea that we're only supposed to share God's grace with, you know, maybe coworkers or maybe, um, you know, maybe people who we go to school with or maybe our neighbors or relatives, but that's kind of it. But, but Jesus said we're to share with everyone. And so here's the thing. When you think about what's going on, it, it, it's, it's really sad to think that, that the forces of darkness are taking over and they want to take over. Now, what should the church do? Sit around and do nothing? No. We need to pray and we need to share the light of the gospel, right? Why? Because we love people and we want what's good for people. We love our children and our grandchildren and we want what's best for them. But here's the thing. When, when people don't do anything, then evil just grows and grows. And there's a lot of examples in history where people did nothing. And unfortunately, many people ignore the lessons of history. And as a result, you all know that we're doomed to repeat those, those same mistakes. And when you look at the history of the nation of Israel, right? Those of you who are students of the Bible, Remember when we studied the book of Judges, that God delivered them from their enemies. God blessed them. They became prosperous and wealthy, and they were doing well. And guess what happened when they were prosperous? In their prosperity, they began to think, we don't need God. We don't need to go to church. We can worship other gods. We can be, do all kinds of pagan things. And what happened? That it caused them to be conquered by their enemies and brought back into bondage, and then the cycle started over again, right? Now, it, it really makes you think about where are we as a nation? What's going on with our nation? And and, you know, as the Bible says in Proverbs 14, 34, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Now, that's just true. In the history of our world, that righteousness has exalted nations and sin has been a reproach to nations. And when you look at the history of our nation, when you wonder, how did we start out? Because basically, now what's happening in our society is people are rewriting history and saying that, you know, how we started as a nation is very different than what we really started. And uh, when you wonder, why did the founding fathers write the Declaration of Independence? Was it because there was nothing good on TV? No. <laughs> why did we separate from Great Britain? Was it because they were bored? No, right? Many of the signers of the Declaration of Independence were pursuing religious liberty. 
The king of England would not allow them to have Bible societies and missionary societies, and they wanted to worship the Lord freely. And in fact, people say, well, Pastor Bob, you know, where do you get this stuff from? Well, the Library of Congress, uh, right? Our government stores these books. You can read them. But 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence were pastors. Uh, well, 50, there were 56 signers. 27 of them were pastors. 27 of them had seminary degrees. So uh, almost half of the guys who signed the Declaration of Independence were pastors. And when you think about, you know, how, what, what was happening at the beginning of our country, the Puritans started in Boston the first elementary school that was paid for with tax dollars. In 1647, they passed an ordinance which marked the beginning of the U.S. public school system, and it put the Bible at its center of curriculum. If you lived in 1647 and your kids went to school, they would have learned how to read from the Bible. But here's the thing, uh, right? Things have changed, and, and why did they change? Well, from my perspective, that, that the church needs to you know, be a light, right? And you all know in 62, they banned prayer from, uh, they banned prayer from public schools. And then in 63, they banned the Bible. Now just think, the first schools in America, it was, it was in their, you know, founding documents that the Bible was to be taught. And now in 62, 63, we banned prayer, banned the Bible. And then in 1980, we banned the Ten Commandments because we said, look, this is going to cause our kids all kinds of grief if we tell them not to lie, not to steal, not to cheat, not to murder. That's going to mess with their mind. But now we're teaching them pornography, right? And it's like, it's just crazy. But, and, and we have progressed quite a ways, uh, right? Uh, we've progressed a, a quite a ways now from where we started. And we wonder, what should we be doing as we're waiting for this seven-year tribulation to come? We need to be lights in this world. We need to be salt in the world. We need to be occupying till he comes. Revelation 3, 8 says, I have set before you an open door that no one can shut, and you have a little strength and have kept my word. So, so God wants us to be out there being a light in the world. Now, Imagine what it's going to be like when the church is gone. I mean, it's going to be crazy, right? I don't know if you've ever thought about how Hitler got to where he got, but you need to know the facts of history are the churches did nothing. When Hitler was saying, hey, we're going to kill all the Jews, and he didn't say it like that. It was deceitful, just like the politicians today. Right? They say, oh, we're really going to do what's good for everybody. We're going to round them anyway. But, right? and, and what happened with sin and Hitler and that whole thing? Well, it, it destroyed Germany, right? And that's just endemic of sin, that sin destroys. And, and it's destructive. It's the nature of sin it destroys. And that's why when we come to church, we need to be reminded sin is destructive. Sin is bad, not because God wants to stop us from having fun, but because he loves us and he doesn't want us to self-destruct. Now, in Revelation 9, 11, it says, and they had a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit. In the Greek, his name is Apollyon. Remember, we read that in Apollyon. It means destroyer. Satan destroys nations. Satan destroys individuals. And, and people are deceived by him and they get destroyed by him. And so there are many people who are deceived, uh, their lives are controlled by evil, and they don't even realize it. And so that will help you to understand what's going on in society. When you look around and you see the crazy things happening, you, you just realize there's a spiritual battle going on. People are being deceived, and their lives are being destroyed, and they don't even realize it, because 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. So they're blinded. So you need to realize that when you see people who are living in, you know, sin, they're blinded. They're deceived by it. And what's our job? To lovingly encourage them that there's a better way to live. And I am so thankful that someone shared it with me, right? And as Christians, I think the enemy wants us all to just be lulled into our daily routines, get up, whatever, read your Bible, watch the prices right. I don't know what you do. I mean, just like, you know, uh, Maybe you don't watch that. It's the wrong group. Maybe a fa- I don't know what you do, but uh, right? Just to be bumbling around and thinking, wonder what God wants me to do. We need to be out there being a light. Now, uh, Paul said that people are blinded by the world's philosophies, and, and you know, the people become blind when they give themselves over to sin, and they lose their ability to make good judgments, and, you know, and their lives are destroyed, and the people are destroyed. And so when you hear about crazy stuff like I shared today, it's because they're blind. They think that's good for people, but it's not, right? Because, uh, you know, the Bible says, John 10, 10, that the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. And I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. Jesus wants people to have an abundant life full of joy and peace and love. He doesn't want us to be confused and deceived and self-destructing, which is what happens when people are deceived by sin. And we see people all the time whose lives are destroyed by sin. And the tragedy is, is quite often people are, you know, having evil going on in their life, and they're being ruled by evil, and, and yet uh, they don't realize it. And maybe even if they do come to the reality that this is bad, they can't change themselves, right? 
They can't free themselves. And, and the, the power of sin is so powerful, they, they can't break free from it. Now, we have the good news. We have the solution. Jesus has the power to set people free from the bondage of sin that people can't get free from. And that's why I'm here today, right? I mean, I was an atheist, and I was addicted to things, although I didn't say that. I, I said, like all people, I can quit whenever I want. And then one of my girlfriends asked me once, why don't you quit? I'm like, because I don't want to. <laughs> I mean, uh, but the reality is, is that sin holds people in bondage, whatever it is. And, you know, we don't have the power to free ourselves from the rule of evil, right? It takes a supernatural power, a greater power that's in you, uh, that, you know, the, a greater power than, than what is controlling you, and that is Jesus Christ. And, and that's why Jesus came. And that's what the Bible tells us, that Jesus came to set us free from the bondage of sin. In John 8, 36, Jesus said, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. That is so good, right? He wants to set you free from those addictions. I love that song that we sang today, bring your addictions, bring them to the foot of the cross. You can come to Jesus and say, Lord, I'm addicted to this or that, whatever it is, drugs or alcohol or pornography or, or gambling or whatever it is, and you can say, Lord, free me. That's what he came to do. Now, sometimes people get the weird idea that we got to get straightened up, and then we come to Jesus. No, right? He came to save sinners. Remember, he said, look, I didn't come for those who are well. A doctor is for what? People who are sick, right? He said, I didn't come for those who don't need a doctor. I came for those who need help. And so today, if you need help in your life, Jesus came to help you. Romans 1.16 says, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. Th that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God to salvation. In, in other words, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, it's amazing the power of the gospel can come in and set you free from the destructive power of sin. And I'm so thankful for that because, you know, sin ruins your life. And, and, and that's why it's so important that we have church because people are sad and discouraged and depressed. And so then they get addicted to drugs and alcohol and pornography and all those things. And that's just a very destructive cycle. Yet Jesus said, I have come to set you free from sin, right? And, and, and today, for all of us, everyone in this room, you're either being ruled by sin or ruled by righteousness. And, and the choice is for every one of us to make that choice. Who do we want to rule us? Do you want to be ruled by sin or do you want to be ruled by righteousness? And, and you know, maybe to put it in a more uh, plain term, do you want to live a clean life or do you want to live a dirty, filthy life, right? My mom used to say that. You have a dirty little mind. I'm like, mm, my mind's pretty clean. I took a shower. I mean, right? but you know what I'm talking about. Like, if you fill it with filthy things or you fill it with good things, right? I love that the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I love that. When I first got saved, I was a filthy person. And I would come to church and I would pray, Lord, cleanse my heart. And then I'd go out with my friends and then I would do things I shouldn't do. And then I'd come back to church and go, oh, I'm a terrible person. Oh, I should stop coming to church. And then I realized, no, Jesus came to cleanse me and to heal me and, and to give me victory over those things. And so one day the Lord helped me to understand that I needed to pray and say, Lord, help me to not be controlled by sin. And, and you know, the Lord just spoke to me and said, Bob, you got to stop hanging around those people who take you to those places where you're doing things you shouldn't do. Right? And, and, and why did the Lord tell me that? Because he loves me. He wants what's best for me. Now, there is a downward path in life, and there's an upward path in life, and every one of us is, one of those, is on one of those two paths, downward or upward. The downward path leads you lower every day. It's a path that leads to regret, confusion, guilt, addiction, and ultimately it leads right to the pit. Now there's an upward path that leads higher every day, and one day that path leads to heaven, right? And that path leads to joy and peace and love and forgiveness and grace and the ability to forgive others the ability to love others like Christ loves us. Now, a wise person looks at their life and says, what path am I on? Where am I going? And, and I would ask every one of you today, have you thought about that? What path you're on and where do you want to end up? And here's the thing. If you surrender your life to the Lord, well, then he wants to lead you on an upward path that he wants to do that's far beyond what you can imagine in your own life. Now, I don't know what you think about what's going to happen in your life or what God has in store for you, but he wants to do great things in your life. In fact, Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. He wants to do great things in your life. And I would ask you, what path are you on today? Maybe you're here and you said, Well, Pastor Bob, I, I, I've tried to change and, and I recognize that things need to be changed in my life, but I can't change. I got these problems. I got these addictions. And, and what can you do? Well, you can decide to come to Jesus and invite Jesus into your life, and you can surrender your life to him and say, Lord, come into my life and help me, change me, 
And he has the power to set you free. It's so good, right? I don't know why anybody would not want to be free, right? Who wants to be in bondage? Well, those who are deceived by sin. And so this morning, you need to know the Lord loves you, and he wants to help you. And he wants to set you free from whatever it is that's holding you back. And you know, it's quite often, people try to change, and they can't change. And so since they can't change, they give up hope. And then they say things like, well, I was born this way. And I would say, of course you were. All of us were. We were all born sinners, right? Everybody understand that? They were all born with a bent to sin, right? I was very good at it before I got saved. <laughs> but here's the thing. It was ruining my life. And I'm so thankful that someone shared the gospel with me. And I just want to let you know that, you know what? The Bible says that we're all sinners, that there's none righteous, no, not one. There's no pure person in this building, not anywhere. The Bible says we're all born sinners. We all need forgiveness. We all need God's grace. We all need that supernatural power to have victory over sin. And so the good news today is what you can't do for yourself, Jesus can do for you. And, and, and I love that, that he can do for you what you can't do for yourself. And so Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In other words, if you're struggling with sin, if you are laboring and heavy laden, if, there's, if sin is controlling you or there's problems in your life or there's a burden in your life, Jesus said, come to me and I'll give you rest. And you don't have to go to Ontario to buy it. 28, and take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus loves you. He offers for you to come to him, and he will lift that heavy burden off you. He'll set you free. All you have to do is invite him in. And so we're going to give you an opportunity to do that right now. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you, Jesus, that you love us and that that we can bring our addictions, we can bring our sin, we can bring our struggles and our burdens, that we can bring them to you and lay them down at the foot of the cross. And Jesus, that you died on the cross to forgive us, to cleanse us, to heal us, to empower us to have victory over sin. So we thank you for your word today. And we do pray, Lord, that if there's anyone here today who needs to be set free, Lord, that they would take that step of faith to invite you in, Lord, to ask you for the power to be free. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.